Wake up. I'm already back to bed. I'm up now. Fix hair. Yes. Brush teeth. Get the tongue. Gag on toothbrush. I have a neck cramp. It hurts really bad. I'm okay. Hydrate. So, short story short, filling up my water bottle takes a long time. Now, I could add a water filter to the sink, since the sink has way more water pressure and it would fill up my water bottle way quicker, but what kind of developer would I be if I didn't spend 20 hours fixing a 30 second task? Facebook or Google would never want me. <laughs> Alright, so here's the deal. I have three water bottles I typically use throughout my day to day. I have my shaker cup for gym bro things. <sighs> Long Rod Johnson for travel. And Big Chungus for heights and house use. Now, Big Chungus, I'll suck on that thing anywhere. Filling these takes a total of about 2 minutes and 30 seconds. 30 seconds for shaker cup, 50 seconds for long rod, and a minute 10 for Big Chungus. Now, Big Chungus, I'll suck on that thing anyway. Multiply those numbers by 365, and we're talking about 15 whole hours of my year being spent filling water bottles. What is my purpose? I fill the water bottle. To decrease this time spent, I decided to devise my own automated water bottle filler, one that fills Shaker Cup, Long Rod, and Big Chungus to their exact measurements without me having to stand around and wait for them to finish. So here we go, how to build this 101. Get a 5 year filter for clean water and to prevent against Florida Man Syndrome. A solenoid valve that only opens when electrical signal is sent to it. A Raspberry Pi so I can run like JS <laughs> and stuff, JavaScript lol, and a f ton of other connectors and other electrical supplies to piece all of the parts together. Now, without a doubt, there's more that goes into this, but as a wise man once said, why do today when you can put it off for tomorrow? Day two, same shirt. And one valve splitter so both my device and the fridge still get water. Metal tubing connects the splitter to the filter, creating a very tight fitting that'll prevent any leaks from arising due to water pressure. Plastic food grade tubing is used on the opposite side of the filter. These food safe plastic barbs create an airtight seal to prevent any additional leaks, something my bed has been afraid of for the past 27 years. The solenoid valve comes into play, serving as a bladder to determine when water can and cannot come out of it. And with that, here is what we have so far. Beautiful. Just like you. Now, looking at this, it looks not bad, I guess, but we really need some sort of electrical circuit in place for this thing to have any value whatsoever. So. Let's go over this one more time. You can kind of think of this as a human's digestive tract. Water goes in, through the mouth, into the liver, which filters out all the toxins, into the bladder, which controls outflow, then if the bladder is opened, we go out the pee pee and directly into your water bottle, just like in real life. So we have a 12 volt power source, the valve, and then a breadboard, <laughs> yummy. Uh, by plugging the power source into the breadboard, we can create a circuit that when the valve wires are integrated, the valve opens creating an audible click, which means it is working as expected. So phase one, phase two, let's go ahead and hit phase three. Wow. 
If there's one thing you need to know about coders, it's that we take programming very seriously. The first step here is to set up a mini computer called a Raspberry Pi. This is what's going to send signals to the water valve to say, open for this amount of time, then close when that time expires. Now, I want to make sure that I can push code updates to this thing through my laptop, so I set up what's known as SSH, secure, shoot. So let's make sure we can log into this from the other room. SSH, pi at 192.168.254, my password, I love something, I don't know what that is, and we're in. Guess what, Caleb? We're in. Caleb. Now, truth be told, even though I've been programming for the past 10 years, I've never actually done a hardware project before. So, with the help of a book, I was able to start piecing the parts together. One, to open the valve remotely via computer. And two, to send input to the Pi with the press of a physical button. Right now, sending input with the physical button is most important because by doing so, I can run a specific portion of code that says to keep the valve open for X amount of time. So I have the basics with hardware and computation setup, but now I really have the problem. Where the hell am I going to put this thing? Friends, meet the shell of Hydrobot 5000. Printing this, I decided to use a new type of plastic, PLA Plus compared to the standard normal PLA. Now, prints with overhangs require supports that you can break off after the plastic cools, but forgetting that I'm a weak little boy, well, this stuff was not coming off by any means. With a few quick tweaks to the model and a new support structure to go with it, my frail bones would be able to pop these props off like it's nobody's business. So I hit print, and the next day, the model was brought to reality. So let's go ahead and put grandma's strength to the test. Yeah, without a doubt, grandma, grandma's strong. With all the supports off, only a few surface imperfections remained. Something we can fix with a little sand and paint. So, I watched a YouTube video once, and now I can undoubtedly declare myself an expert on the task. My rate is one million dollars an hour. The idea here is to sand out all of the imperfections so you can spray paint over the base and give it a smooth and even look. So, with a little bit of a brush brush here and a little bit of brush brush there, uh, basically you can see that it looks like complete garbage. Just what I was going for. So, going outside for the first time in about two years, I believe, it was time to give the shell one layer of primer filler. This fills in all, well, at least most of the imperfections that would have been more visible had we gone straight to painting this thing. So, after a day of drying, you take it back inside for wet sanding, first at 240 grit, second at 400 grit, and third at 800 grit. And now, you can really see just how this steaming pile of junk has turned into this smooth, sexy object of desire. So let's finish this off. One, two, three, and now we have something that looks pretty... pretty good. You know, I like it. So roll out the blue carpet, aka a silicone mat, because if you're wondering what that large opening in the front is for, well, let's just say I want to be rewarded with visual light feedback every time I fill my water bottle, Yes, programmed monkey I am. So whipping up a quick batch of epoxy, it was finally time for the pour of all pours. Oh boy, oh boy. So Chris, how did that, how did that turn out for you? Oh well, uh, it's funny you ask, cause just like my investments in GME, my epoxy fizzled and failed. 
Legend has it, if you use a fast hardener for your epoxy, you're gonna have a bad time. So, me being big brain, I decided to use the fast hardener again. But once again, senpai, I have failed you. <laughs> so I did a third one, ran out of black plastic, switched brands of epoxy, and yeah, that actually seemed to do the trick. Minor overflow since my World of Warcraft cookbook clamp just isn't what you should be using for this kind of work, but nothing a little sand and can't fix. So slightly altered process here, we protect, prime, sand, paint, peel, 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 peel. Job's done. Inspect. Me, likey. It's day 23, or something along the lines of that, and I just now decided to put the button components in their designated slots. One for Long Rod, one for Shaker, one for Big Chungus, and you, well, I don't know what you're there for, but you look cool. Now here's a trick I learned from the YouTube greats. If your components don't fit in their designated slots, you can take a heat needle, soldering iron, and press it against your components until they melt into place. As I've been told many times before, size doesn't matter. And it's no difference for the size of this button. Doesn't fit, well, we're just gonna melt it into place. With the inputs embedded into the shell, it's time to make what's on this breadboard a little more permanent. This is done through soldering onto what's known as a perf board, a perforated board. All these little components, resistors, output cables, transistors, go through the board's holes, and solder is used to create connections and circuits between them. Not the easiest thing to do if you have shaky hands like me, but eventually, it's achievable, nevertheless. I don't want everything soldered onto the board permanently, such as the valve and its power cable, so I bought a couple of external connectors that I could use to connect the two together when ready. Finally, it was just a matter of getting the big button integrated into the circuit, since I decided to YOLO it instead of test it on the breadboard but looks like we're good to go. And here is the Frankenstein I created. Yes, barf, I know. Although I technically could install the dispenser just like this, I, I absolutely refuse it. It was my Destiny-like mission to make this thing a little cleaner. So lesson number one, if you're lazy like me and want to spend the least amount of time trying to secure components, Velcro is going to be your best friend, no exceptions. Now, a big part as to why this looks so messy is cable management. If you're dealing with a lot of cables, ideally you'll want to bundle them up together to reduce hang and clutter. If you want to be really clean, you could use cable sleeves for already bundled wires, but that's actually something I'll be skipping here. If you're wondering what these are, well, surprise! During the solder sesh, I added in three strips of programmable LED lights. Since we're using a translucent white epoxy fill for this cavity here, I programmed these lights to shine through whenever the dispenser is turned on, something to be tested very shortly. And this, this has been staring me in the face and it just looks so bad. So I removed the velcro mountain, snipped the middle of the perf board that wasn't being used, and yeah, edgy shot to show it's a little better. <laughs> One thing to note, if the LEDs are too close to the epoxy, you'll actually be able to see them individually. Something I don't really want, so I made a small 3D printed brace to make sure that the LEDs are placed far enough to create an even spread out glow. For the LEDs to work, I had to write quite a bit of code, and boy, let me tell you, it took a lot longer than I expected. Classic dev things. There wasn't any direct JavaScript Raspberry Pi package that would allow me to run different variations of light sequences like I would have preferred, and as a result, I had to manually code out some sequences that determined which LEDs would turn on, when they turn on, and in what order would they turn on. So the only real way to test this is in the dark, of course, where I consistently spend my day. SSHing into the Pi, it was just a matter of running one of the scripts I wrote and hitting enter to beam up some lights. I wrote three different variations, one that consistently cycles between different shades of hue, one that beams lights in a downward direction, progressively getting faster as time goes on, and one that chooses random colors for every LED and cycles between them. Finally, it was just a matter of getting this thing mounted. Once determining where to place this, I scored a rectangle, the same size as the one on the back of the dispenser, and began cutting using an oscillating tool. 
With the full rectangle cut out, it was time to move the fridge. One, so I could hook up the electronics with some breathing room, and two, so I could attach the water filter to a water source. Popping this in, the fit was much more exact than I expected it to be. No velcro screws or glue required. On the back side, it was time to mount the pie, which of course I did with my BFF Velcro. Connected all the inputs to their associated pins, passed the water tubing through its corresponding slot, and began snaking the opposite end of it towards the sink, since that's the only location in the kitchen where water comes in. With the water connected, it was just a matter of plugging this thing in. Well, that, and sending timeout functions in the code to make sure the water turns off after the bottle is actually full. Don't want any leaks here. No, sir. Once all the correct timings were inserted, it was time for the finishing move. One spout prop to ensure the water shoots straight down, and a finishing snip to call it a day. Everyone, thank you so much for watching. If you would like to learn how to program, how to code, similar to like what I just did in this video, be sure to check out chriscourses.com, basically a tutorial learning site that'll teach you everything that I have learned within my past 10 year career. Everything that I've learned is over there and it's just continuously building, so be sure to check it out. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next video. Peace.